This was Havana in the 1950s. It was a modern metropolis with a unique colonial charm, a charm which attracted hundreds of thousands of visitors each year to this, the playground of the Americans. These were the carefree days, days of casino gambling, flashing neon lights, nightclubs, and tropical shows danced to the rumba beat. But behind the glamour lay a country with deeply rooted political problems. Six million Cubans were governed by the dictatorial regime of President Fulgencio Batista, a government plagued with corruption and the belief in politics for personal gain. But there was rebellion in the wind. That wind stirred through the rugged mountains of the Sierra Maestra in the easternmost province of Oriente, where a small number of rebels, led by a young lawyer named Fidel Castro, began a revolution. Years of struggle succeeded late in December of 1958, when the crumbling and demoralized Batista regime was brought to its knees. In the early morning hours of January 1st, 1959, Batista, his family, and close associates fled Cuba. For Cuban history, it marked the end of an era. A week later, 300,000 Cubans jammed the streets of Havana to give a rousing hero's welcome to the victorious Revolutionary Army and its leader. Castro, now firmly in power, gazed upon his people, who viewed him as a symbol of freedom and democracy. However, it soon became a stark reality that Cuba was on the path of becoming a communist state. That revelation sparked the greatest mass exodus in Cuban history. Over half a million Cubans chose an unwanting and confusing exile. My family and I were among the many. years I had dreamed and hoped of returning to this land. But as the years went by, the hope became an obsession. I came driven by curiosity and the desire to learn and understand the Cuban people and comprehend their complex revolution, which climaxed Cuba's long and turbulent political history. One does not need to look far to realize a revolution has been a revolution in the true sense of the word. Life has drastically changed here from the way I knew it as a child. To learn of the changes, I went back to my neighborhood. And here is where I lived 18 years ago. This is the Quinta Avenida, or Fifth Avenue in Miramar. Once an exclusive upper middle class suburb of Havana, it is now the home for many Russian and Czechoslovakian technicians. This 8mm home movie was shot in my family's front yard in April of 1952. The occasion was my second birthday party. It should be noted that only an affluent Cuban family could afford the luxury of having color home movies back then. The plushly decorated interior of the rented four-bedroom house renders an idea of how my parents and I lived. Unlike most Cubans, we were fortunate. We belonged to an elite. The Cuban Revolution was not created to benefit us. And this is the same house today. It appears abandoned and badly in need of paint. Our ex-landlord, 62-year-old Bebo Bernal, now lives there along with three families, a sure sign of Cuba's critical housing shortage. Although Bernal owns the house, he does not collect rent. He says he has wanted to paint the house for over 15 years, but paint is scarce in Cuba and almost impossible to buy. However, the house next door is freshly painted and well kept. I later found out a high government official lives there. Inside my former home, conditions are deteriorating. The walls are cracking and the paint is peeling. Our Zenith television has been replaced by a Russian make. The gas oven we used miraculously still works but the door is broken, and replacing it is impossible, a victim of the embargo. Our once beautiful backyard is now full of chickens. The three families Olivia raise and eat them. Chicken is rationed in Cuba, and this is one way of solving the rationing problem. 
after we said our goodbyes, Bernard went to his room. And I couldn't help but notice that he now lives in what used to be the maid's room. This was my school, once called St. John Baptiste de La Salle. It was run by Christian brothers until Fidel Castro ordered all religious private schools shut down. The school was taken over by the state and is now called Pablo de la Torrente Brau, named after a revolutionary martyr. The church we went to mass on Sundays in is now closed. There are bars at the entrance. The exclusive social club we went to is still open, but it's no longer exclusive and is now named after another revolutionary martyr. My old neighborhood is an example of how the revolution has changed the Cuban people and affected their way of life. Some for the better, some for the worse. Much dependent on one's social class in pre-revolutionary days. I've been here over two and a half weeks, but I still can't quite believe, grasp the fact that I am actually walking along this avenue. For 18 years ago, I lived, played, went to school, and spend my Saturday afternoons watching westerns in that very theater. I suppose it's difficult for me to believe that I'm here, because like so many other thousands of exiles, I have longed to return to my country for many years. Yes, there are many socioeconomic changes, some good, some bad. There's a new revolutionary way of life, which I don't believe I could get accustomed to living in. But as I walk along this nostalgic avenue, I can't help but to admit to myself, it's good to be home. January 29th, 1955. Skier Jill Kinmont, only a step away from the Olympics, is cut down by a tragic fall. I flew into the air off this bump and tumbled down the steep transition. Jill's fall left her paralyzed with a broken neck, but it could not break her spirit. Monday at 7.30, Bo Bridges narrates the story of Jill's incredible comeback as a teacher and community leader. Jill Kinmont's story, Monday at 7.30, on Channel 10. To a person who is blind, a white cane, dark glasses, and braille books are standard everyday tools. These tools may differ from those you commonly use. A child, unlike many adults, relates to the total human being and regards a disability as a feature of interest. How do you react? At first glance, Havana seems like the Havana of yesteryear. Its streets, parks, and buildings with their colonial architecture are still picturesque. The city has nobly fought back against hard times by retaining much of its ageless charm. Although the Havana skyline remains intact, inevitably the city has changed. A prime example is the Presidential Palace. Once Batista's majestic office building is now the Museum of the Revolution. It is filled with memorabilia and pictures depicting in detail the revolutionary struggle and its ultimate triumph. At the entrance, there is a tank, which Castro reportedly used to sink the American ship Houston in the Bay of Pigs. Behind the museum, enshrined in glass, is the yacht Grandma, which Castro and his early followers used in 1956 to return to Cuba after a brief exile in Mexico. The Capitol building is no longer the home of government. The Senate and its representative powers have been dissolved. The Communist Party, headed by Castro, governs Cuba from buildings surrounding a monument to Cuban liberator Jose Marti in the Plaza de la Revolución, or Revolutionary Square. This used to be Camp Colombia, where Batista's high-level officers and their families lived. It is now called Ciudad Libertad, City of Freedom. The large office buildings have been converted into schools from elementary to pre-university levels. The opulent officers' homes are now student quarters. What hasn't changed are the cars Cubans drive along the wave-swept Malecon. These are remnants of an age long ago. Havana is an antique car collector's paradise. The cars are kept puttering along with Russian makeshift parks and a dash of Cuban ingenuity. 
The boarded up American embassy is also a remnant of bygone days. Abandoned 16 and a half years ago, a U.S. administrative survey team has ordered repairs be made to correct structural deficiencies, all in preparation for next month's arrival of U.S. diplomats who will work here as part of the Swiss Embassy. Five blocks up the street is a Hotel Havana Riviera, Ireland's old stomping grounds. Built in the 50s, partially with Mafia money, the hotel has just recently been refurbished by the government, just in time for the ironic return of American tourists. The entrance of this cruise ship into Havana Harbor earlier this summer marked the first time that a boatload of Americanos had sailed here since diplomatic relations were severed in 1961. Once they disembarked, it didn't take them long to realize that things had drastically changed were the days of casino gambling, lotteries, and prostitution. Socialist Puritanism has purged Cuba of these so-called capitalist evils. A familiar tourist spot, the Tropicana remains, as always, the hit of Havana's nightlife. The shows in this unique outdoor nightclub are still lavishly staged, but no longer sensual. The dancers wore more clothing and show less skin, all in accordance with revolutionary morals. Leonard Park in the outskirts of Havana is a favorite recreation spot for thousands of tourists and Cubans alike. Acquired recently from Japan, it can best be described as a quasi-socialist Disney World. Cuba is a country where shortages are a way of life. From food, to medicine, to clothing, each and every Cuban has learned to accept it, though getting used to it has been far more difficult. We're in the Liano department store, the heart of downtown Havana. It's where Woolworth used to be, a place where a million and one things could be found. The Cubans still fondly refer to it as a 10 cent store, although when they walk in these days, what they do find is a far cry from that legendary one million and one. Many shelves are empty, and the few products that are on display are either made in Cuba or imported from socialist countries. The effects of the embargo are quite evident here. As always, San Rafael Street is still bustling with shoppers, but if you notice closely, you'll note few are carrying any packages or bags. The products on display in storefront windows do not necessarily mean the store has them in stock. There are electrical appliances available, but their costs are astronomical, considering the average Cuban earns 125 pesos a month. For example, 650 pesos will buy the small Cuban-made refrigerator. However, if one is shown to be a true, hard-working and dedicated revolutionary, the state may grant him a considerable discount in exchange for one's loyalty. Rationing is very much a part of the Cuban lifestyle. Blamed on the embargo and the country's economic priorities, rationing has been in existence in Cuba for 16 long years, and there's no indication it's on the way out. Cubans are entitled to 12 ounces of meat and one pound of chicken every nine days. Rice is rationed at four pounds a month, and even sugar, Cuba's most abundant agricultural product, is rationed to four pounds a month. There is no rationing, however, on detergents, baby foods, pastas, eggs, fish, and sweets. It should also be noted that the price of food has hardly gone up here in 12 years. Worldwide inflation has not affected the Cuban housewife's pocketbook, much due to control low national wages and a sizable economic assistance from the Soviet Union. The Soviets do help by buying Cuban sugar three times the current world market price of 8.9 cents a pound. They also help by supplying the Cubans with everything under the sun, from medicine to machinery to wheat, the last of which the United States ironically sells to the Soviet Union. In addition, these goods and many others like them are provided at a considerable discount. Russian gasoline, for example, is sold to the Cubans at one-third off the world-going rate. 
These discounts are the primary reason why the effects of worldwide inflation have hardly been felt here during the past decade. But in spite of its immunity from inflation, Cuba is suffering from serious economic problems, many of which lead to the sugarcane fields, where final figures of the 1977 crop, a closely guarded government secret, is estimated by American economic and agricultural experts to be not more than a disastrous five million tons. Blamed on bad weather, the small harvest, coupled with the low world market price of sugar, will inevitably lock Cuba into tighter Soviet trade and force it off the world market with a profit's lie, needing the stricter rationing and more belt tightening. After 18 years of revolutionary life, economic prosperity is still not around the corner. Partial blame for the country's economic ills fall on this man. After 18 and a half years in power, Fidel Castro is still the bearded, pistol-carrying revolutionary. Loved, hated, feared, he is the symbolic figure of the Cuba of today. He remains its absolute leader. Heavily guarded, he has miraculously survived countless assassination attempts, an invasion, and has overcome his greatest fear of all, defeat. Now in middle age, he has more composure and discipline. His ideas are sacred and put into practice. His political ideology is the law of the state. It is a state which controls the life of each and every Cuban. It controls where and how he can work, how much he can earn, where he can live, where he can buy, how much of it, what he can say, and even what he can read. This man is selling the Grama, the official Cuban Communist Party newspaper, which every true, loyal, hardworking revolutionary is expected to read. The press is also controlled in Cuba. By law, freedom of the press is prohibited. Many of these controls are carried out in part by the committees for the defense of the revolution. The CDRs are charged with vigilance. There is a committee in every block and a member in every building. Originally formed by Castro to unmask and detect counter-revolutionaries during the revolution's embryonic years in power, it now performs other social functions, keeping the block clean, to settling disputes between neighbors, and even resolving marital problems. Volunteer work is very much a part of revolutionary life. Those who refuse are frowned upon and eventually become outcasts. A young couple may be asked to send watch through the night or help out in a daycare center. The responsibilities have been well defined. They are essential in the construction of Cuban socialism. And this is a constructive example. The true revolutionary helps lay the foundation of his home and that of his neighbors. Many of these workers helping in the construction of this apartment building will eventually live here. It is the revolution's reward for their efforts, patience, and loyalty. 38,000 workers have been rewarded with an apartment here at Alamar, a high-rise housing project built of concrete block and stucco just east of Havana with the help of Soviet and East European architects. When first constructed, a curious and unexpected social phenomenon occurred here, which startled Cuban sociologists. Many of the families who initially moved into this experimental housing project came from backward rural areas where indoor plumbing and electricity were non-existent. The drastic change in lifestyle proved to be too revolutionary. Within a few short months, these model homes, the hopes of the Cuban socialist future, became slums. Instead of eliminating slums, the revolution inadvertently was creating more of them. After much analytic study, a solution was found. Today, families from rural areas and urban slums are first placed in thousands of pre-existing homes where they learn to rid themselves of their slovenly ways. When they've learned to become neat housekeepers, they're rewarded with an apartment like this one at Alamar, along with a discounted black and white television set. In the rural areas, the revolution confronted a different housing problem. Here, homes were distant and far apart. 
In an effort to attain greater usage of the land through collective farming, the revolution lured many campesinos or farmers into these four-story buildings, complete with electricity, indoor plumbing, and yes, a television set. Many have been lured, but others have chosen to remain on their land, leading their more traditional lifestyle, farming their small plots. Rural life has greatly improved for the campesinos. For example, hundreds of rural hospitals have been constructed throughout the island, providing badly needed medical services to the traditionally neglected farming family. Another example is, from the moment a woman becomes pregnant, the state supervises a pregnancy free of charge. For all intent and purposes, the fetus belongs to the state for the purpose of protection. The mother is obliged to attend monthly checkups and be prepared to be committed to a nursing home should any complications arise. Whether in rural or urban surroundings, each and every Cuban, male and female, must work. Each must contribute to the progress and future stability of the revolutionary system. And herein lies the future. 45 days after a baby is born, he or she unknowingly becomes part of the Cuban educational system. Before going to work, parents must turn their sons and daughters over to a child care center, where for eight to 10 hours a day, the state takes care of nursing, feeding, and bathing the infant. next six years before going on to elementary school, the child will learn to live and interact with his fellow classmates, both white and black. He will be given tasks to perform and will begin to accept responsibilities. By the age of 10, those responsibilities have been firmly implanted. The youngster now belongs to the Pioneers, a scout-like youth organization formed to foster socialist and revolutionary principles. He is loyal, obedient, well-versed, and deeply patriotic. We're 30 kilometers southeast of Havana, out in the countryside. And this is the Che Guevara High School. At 7 o'clock in the morning now, for 600 students here, the school day is about to begin. At first observation, these students learn the same basic courses that are taught in American classrooms, the sciences, mathematics, and even English. But the real differences come in the teachings of history and the communist theories of Marxism and Leninism. In this history class, students are being taught about America's big stick policy, with particular reference to the American intervention into Nicaraguan affairs in 1910. The teacher is depicting the struggle of the working man against imperialist aggression. The big stick policy, he says, is very much alive today, and cites a 1961 Bay of Pigs invasion, the U.S. military intervention in Santo Domingo in 1965, and Vietnam as modern-day examples. Che Guevara High School is the first of many schools the revolution has built in the traditionally neglected rural areas where illiteracy once ran high. Here, the students live, study, and work in the neighboring citrus groves during the weekdays. The weekends are free to spend with their families. For the student who achieves high marks, there is a bright future. But he or she may wind up studying the profession or trade the state dictates. For here, education exists to benefit the revolution first, the individual second. We're still the ones. We've been together since way back when. It's so much nicer here than up there. I actually felt guilty telling old friends, my home is Miami. Isn't that silly? I said, Dad, we've lived in Miami for four years. We love it. Miami's our home. Now he calls Miami home too, and it's even better. It's hard to leave a home and friends up north, but Miami's a good place for a family. Once you decide to call it home, it makes it even better. 
entrance to the Cuban province of Matanzas, a sign on the highway reads, Welcome to Matanzas, where imperialism suffered its first great defeat in Latin America. Further down the road, another sign reads, up to this point came the mercenaries. Playa Hidon in the Bay of Pigs, bitter memories. The Cubans here and those in exile have not forgotten what took place on this now desolate stretch of beach one April morning, 16 years ago. Trained and backed by the CIA, 1,297 Cuban exiles landed. Their objective, to overthrow the Fidel Castro regime. When it finally came, the invasion was a surprise to no one, least of all Castro, whose first move was to place his air force on the alert and mobilize his militia for immediate confrontation with the enemy. Within a few short hours, all roads leading to the invasion site were jammed with men, armored cars, and tanks. After 36 hours of desperate fighting, the invaders were surrounded by 20,000 troops. They were badly outnumbered. To achieve victory, the exiles had relied heavily upon U.S. military support and the support of the Cuban people, none of which ever materialized. Surrender became inevitable. After 20 months of imprisonment, they were ransomed. The Kennedy administration agreed to pay Cuba $53 million worth of food and medicine for their release. Today, after 16 years, the memories remain vivid. They are kept alive in part by this museum, which the government set up in the small town of Hiron shortly after the ill-fated invasion. These are remnants of that April day long ago. A plane used by Castro's Air Force to drive back the invaders. The remains of a propeller from an invading plane shot down during the brief battle. An American-made Sherman tank. A U.S. Army truck. And a launch boat. The revolution has clearly not allowed the Cuban people to forget and encourages them to be on their guards at all time against what they term another act of imperialist aggression. It is seemingly incredible to believe that on this peaceful stretch of beach, one spring morning 16 years ago, men fought, died, and were wounded. For the revolution had meant its greatest victory against Yankee imperialism and the dreaded CIA. For the exile invaders, it meant defeat and humiliation. But the new Kennedy administration, it meant shame and embarrassment. The years have passed now. This pillbox is no longer in use. But still, planned efforts between both countries to renew diplomatic relations will no doubt be hampered by the haunting memories of that April day long ago. For many on both sides, those memories linger on and remain very much a reality. Bill Urbizu, News Watch 10, Playa Hidon, Cuba. Good evening. This was a very ceremonious day in both Havana and Washington as Cuban and American envoys took their posts in the first exchange between the two countries in 17 years. We have reports on the embassy openings in both locations. First, Newswatch reporter Bill Urbizu in Havana. On the 3rd of January, 1961, the doors to the American embassy here in Havana closed down. Infuriated at Fidel Castro's rising criticism of U.S. foreign policy, his communist leanings, and the last straw, his confiscation of American properties, the Eisenhower administration ordered its diplomats here to shut the doors, pack their bags, and leave for home, seemingly forever. But as the saying goes, time heals all wounds. And today, after 16 and a half years, the doors reopened. <laughs> The door is open at noon. More than a hundred diplomats representing some 50 nations from around the world were greeted. They were met by Larry Lance, the U.S. envoy who heads a 10-member American diplomatic delegation. Larry's job is considered a sensitive one. The U.S. intersection will in actuality be an embassy in everything but name. 
represent U.S. interests and perform consular duties, all under the auspices of the Swiss Embassy. Will it also be your responsibility to find ways to negotiate towards a full normalization of relations? Well, the objective is to talk and lead toward possible negotiations on all of the problems between the countries. And obviously, normalization would be that final result. At the opening ceremony in the embassy's lobby, both sides call for greater understanding, mutual respect, and goodwill, leading to progressive negotiations. Pelegrin Torras, a deputy foreign minister, was the highest-ranking Cuban official to attend the ceremony. Torres called today's diplomatic event an important one in the history of U.S.-Cuban relations. When do you feel normalization of relations between the United States and Cuba will be realized? It is not uh, possible to, to say when, because it is not easy. Uh, there are many problems, many important problems that have to, uh, to be overcome. The ceremony was wisely shortened down to 15 minutes, mostly because the embassy's air conditioning system did not work. But there were no complaints about the heat, perhaps because the event was too important and too longly awaited. And so the doors have finally reopened. The wall has slowly begun crumbling down. Today's diplomatic exchange falls far short of full diplomatic relations, but it is viewed as a significant step which will simplify the process of normalization. Though inevitable, optimistic observers here concede it is still years away. Bill Urbizu, News Watch 10, at the American Embassy, Havana.